On today's episode of You Asked, why do sports look so terrible on TVs now? Why don't manufacturers just calibrate their TVs at the factory? What's the best 55 inch TV under $600? And what's the best small screen premium TV? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, where I answer the questions that you asked in hopes of helping you as well as others who might have similar questions. Before I dive into the first question, I wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. In the last episode of this series, I asked for you to do what you could to spread the video around and it looks like we reached some new viewers. Plus, it's clear that interest is high enough in this series that we can keep doing it. So thank you so much for coming through for me and you know, <laughs> please feel free to keep it up. The better these videos do, the more resources I can pour into them and the more entertaining and helpful they can be. So clickety click, please, thankity thanks. Okay, no, let's uh, get to the first question. And that first question comes from James and he writes, why is picture calibration still required, particularly in high-end TVs? Given the manufacturers have the equipment and expertise to do the tests and create the picture presets, why or how is there scope for improvement? Um, so I love this question because I think a lot of folks wonder the same thing. Here's my best answer. Every TV that rolls off a manufacturer's line is adjusted to some degree. Even low-end TVs need to produce colors that look at least close to what we identify with. Uh, if a TV's reds were just blatantly orange, for example, nobody would want to buy that TV. So there's a baseline level of acceptability, even for budget TVs, and that gets taken care of at the factory. The kind of calibration I think you're talking about is the act of fine-tuning a set so that it matches as closely as possible a certain standard. But what is that standard exactly? Well, if you're Sony, Samsung, LG, TCL, Hisense, Panasonic, Philips, your job is to make your TVs as broadly appealing as possible, right? The more amount of people that like them, the more they can sell them. And perhaps more importantly, the fewer returns they're likely to get. That's why we see multiple picture mode presets in TVs, because maybe you like the way the vivid mode looks, or maybe you're more of a standard mode person. Taking that notion a step further, the reason that TVs ship with the standard picture mode as the default, like right out of the box, it's gonna be standard mode, and by extension with motion smoothing also enabled by default, that's because way more consumers like that look over the look of a movie or cinema mode preset. By appealing to the largest audience possible, brands sell more TVs and keep more TVs sold. So let's take that logic one step further. Those who prefer the movie or cinema mode are a specific type of customer. Generally, they know what they want, and if they don't already know how to get to it, they're willing to put the work in to get there. So just having a movie, cinema, or equivalent mode is gonna scratch the itch of those who prefer a warm color temperature or colors that are perhaps not quite as exuberant but are more accurate, etc. But even within that already niche crowd who prefers the movie or cinema mode, there's a majority of folks who, for example, prefer motion smoothing. They prefer SDR programming that is brighter than what the standard calls for. They prefer brighter peak HDR highlights over subtle highlight details, which places those of us who want studio standard reference quality image reproduction in a sort of super niche category. We are a minority within a minority of customers. Now, with all of that in mind, how much time, effort, and cost, also known as financial loss, do you think a huge corporation is willing to take on? The answer is not enough to satisfy a super minority within their customer base. Even Sony, which caters to the enthusiast perhaps more enthusiastically than any other brand, except maybe Panasonic, they only get their TV's professional mode preset 95% of the way there because in that last 5% resides a bunch of factors that cannot be addressed with the wave of one calibration wand. There's too much variance between panels to get every TV that rolls off the line to be as close to dead on accurate as possible. It must be done on a per TV basis. It's gonna involve a human, and until AI gets smart enough to do it, it's gonna require hours of work. A bespoke calibration on a per TV basis performed by a manufacturer is a sure way to go broke. 
or they could do it, but they need to charge like double for the TV set. Why do that when you can have it done in your home for way less? Anyway, I hope that helps. It's about scale and economy. Maybe I should have just said that in the first place. I don't know. Next, Yuri writes, Hey Caleb, love your content all the way from Jamaica. Currently in the market for a new budget to mid-range TV. However, I'm not sure which to choose from. I've seen your review of the TCL Q7, which I like, but I wanted other options like the Hisense U7K, which still waiting on your review, by the way. Yeah, Yuri, you and a bunch of others. Anyway, Yuri goes on to say, my budget is up to 600 USD. My preference is 120 Hertz native, HDMI 2.1 ports, at least two of them, 55 inches, local dimming, Google TV preferred. P.S. Do you think I should wait for Black Friday to get the better deals? Well, way to sneak that second question in there, Yuri, but I'm glad you asked both questions. My Hisense U7K review is coming out very soon. Actually, by the time this video publishes, I think it will have just come out. So you probably already know what I'm gonna say, right? 55 inch TV for under 600 bucks, get the Hisense U7K. You can thank me with some curry goat and pepper pot soup when I come to visit you. Also, as for waiting for Black Friday, you might as well. I don't know that prices are gonna drop that much, but if you're not in a super big hurry, I mean, we're getting pretty close now, so I know I probably would. Next is a really, really important one. In fact, I might have to do a separate video about this. Uh, the viewer writes, what is the best TV for sports viewing? I see lots of TVs which, even with motion smoothing enabled, cannot keep the picture quality nice and clear at 4K. For example, when a football is thrown in the air, you can see the football slowly blurring all over the screen. What TVs do a good job with this, and is there a software feature that I don't understand or have enabled? My old Sharp LCD 1080p TV never had this issue. Okay. I get asked about the best TVs for sports all the time. I actually made a video about that earlier this year, right ahead of the Super Bowl, and disappointingly, despite our genius timing, it didn't do all that well. Anyway, one thing I haven't addressed with specificity is why folks are asking this question more often than ever before. And that last comment from the viewer hints at why. My old TV didn't have this issue. Well, it's true. We didn't notice the kind of thing that the viewer is talking about, the blurring football nearly as much years ago. And it's understandable that we tie that to our old TVs being better in some way. But while there is something to upscaling low resolution 720p content up to 4K being more difficult and prone to artifacts than just upscaling to 1080p, the reality is that the problem isn't that our TVs have gotten worse, it's that the TV signal has gotten worse. Whether you're streaming TV from YouTube TV, Sling or Fubo, or you're getting your sports from cable or satellite, our TV signals have gotten more and more compressed over the years. More channels, higher resolution, same pipe. I mean, how do you fit more signal down the same pipe? You compress the living daylights out of it. And the more compression gets applied, the more difficult it is to maintain any level of detail in fast moving shots, especially if the frame rate is below 60 FPS. I see this all the time when watching golf on YouTube. That tiny white ball is a little glowing orb of nondescript mess. It looks nothing like a golf ball, never mind the green around it, and it drives me nuts. So I definitely feel your pain. There is no TV in existence, not even the best performing TVs of the year, one of which I'm testing right now, that can magically fill in the massive loss of information that is lost due to aggressive compression that's taking place in our source signals. Worse, the quality of the signal varies by channel, by network, by provider, even down to the specific game or match that's being televised. So it's, it's a moving target. So I will once again point to the best TVs for sports this year. I just need everyone to understand that even the very best TVs on the market, which I promise you have exponentially better processing than your 1080p TV from 10 years ago. They can't work magic with the lame signals that we're getting these days. Speaking of old TVs, this next one just popped up in my inbox this morning and it really got me thinking, so I just had to fit this one in. Ben, who also hails from Oregon, is ready to upgrade his TV from a 15-year-old Toshiba 40-inch LCD. That's an LCD TV with a fluorescent backlight, and it has S-Video, y'all, just to put that into perspective. At first, I was like, no problem. Just about anything I recommend is gonna be a huge step up from what he has now. Except, 
Ben has some specific asks that I definitely don't hear very often. First, he'd like to keep the screen size small, under 55 inches. Second, he likes to keep his stuff for a long time, so he's looking for a TV that will last. He also mentions the importance of upscaling, so we can keep that in mind. Oh, and his budget is $1,500. But those first two requirements, well, they got me thinking about a segment of TVs that I don't think I talk about enough on this channel. While there are exceptions, and I'll list them out in a moment, it is not common to see the best performing TVs in screen sizes under 55 inches. The 42 and 43 inch screen sizes don't often get the premium treatment. So while I would love to recommend, say, a Sony X93L or X90L, I can't because that model doesn't exist in a screen size under 55 inches. Actually, most of the premium TVs in the 42 or 43 inch screen size category are OLED TVs. And while those are plenty premium, but Ben wants his TV to last a long time. And while OLED TVs can last a long time by today's standards, that longevity comes with a few caveats. Plus, the oldest consumer OLED TV just celebrated its 10th birthday. So we are like five years away from any 15 year precedent for an OLED TV, keeping in mind that first gen OLED is probably not a good yardstick to go by anyway. And so this is a uniquely challenging question to answer. From a brand perspective, I'm tempted to recommend Sony because their build quality and longevity numbers look great. Uh, second to that, I would say a Samsung QLED or an LG OLED, uh, keeping in mind that I'm slightly reluctant to recommend an OLED in general because I don't know how hard Ben uses his TV, but also because OLED compounds do break down over long periods of time. So ideally, I'd be recommending a 42-inch Sony LCD TV, except Sony's best LCD models are not available at a size that small, as I've already mentioned. So the best 42-inch Sony LCD is the X85K from 2022. That's a decent TV, no doubt, and probably gonna look significantly better in most ways than the 15-year-old Toshiba he's rocking. That TV is also only 600 bucks. But given Ben's budget of 1500 bucks, I sense he's looking for something pretty premium. So Ben, I have to recommend that you get an OLED where longevity is a bit of a concern or make peace with the idea that you need to step up to 55 inches to get the quality that you want. Because unfortunately, you can't take your budget and get more premium performance in a smaller screen size unless you go OLED. So there's the Sony A90K or LG C3 OLEDs or the Samsung QN90C QLED TV. I'd rather see you get the Sony OLED, honestly, but the Samsung QN90C QLED is probably a better match all the way around. Or step up to 55 inches and see the abundance of choices come flooding to your doorstep. Also, I would let go of this idea that TVs made today will last anywhere close to 15 years. It's true what they say, they just don't build them like they used to. Thanks as always for watching everyone. Don't forget to send your questions to youasked at digitaltrends.com. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.